the choir is going to lead us in this song called Jesus the Same. It's a fun song. Uh, so if you want to follow along with us as we sing, uh, I just encourage you to do that today. Jesus, Jesus, no other name, nothing. 
they do a great job of that. that you know, I'm trying to Forever. And I want to challenge you. Maybe, maybe you like this thing. Maybe you like this thing in a group. Um, our choir just needs some friends to fill these seats in. All right? And maybe that friend is you. And so the next time they have practice, show up. And I, next Sunday when they have practice, show up. And I can guarantee you, Aaron will get you a seat. All right? So you come be a part of that. If you're a guest today in the Calvary Baptist Church, we are so glad that you're here. In the chair in front of you, there should be a connection card. If you would just reach and... Uh, take that, fill it out. There are several ways in which we can engage with you. Maybe you need some special prayer. Uh, possibly you'd like to have a minister contact you. If uh, Maybe you're interested in membership. However, however we can minister to you, please let us know what that is. The offer plate will come by in just a few moments. Just place it in there. We're so glad that the Lord has led you to be our guest in worship today. Uh, today's a busy, busy day. Really, really good day in the life of our church. We have our trunk or treat tonight, and so we will probably have... If uh, the past is prologue, somewhere between five and 600 guests come on the property tonight. And so we have 50 plus cars that are going to be giving out candy. If you had intended to do that and didn't, didn't sign up, don't worry about it. Just bring your car here. Have it here by five o'clock tonight. The cars will be parked in the parking lot that is on the other side of the chapel. So the other side of the building, make certain you're there um, by five o'clock. It will get started at 530. Uh, we still need some help. Um, guarding the inflatables um, with security, some help in the kitchen, and some help with cleanup and set up. And so if you will go by and put your name on the dotted line at the Welcome Center today, look forward to a great night tonight. Um, next week, we're going to be doing something a little bit different for this service. Um, in the transition of going to two services, we want to make certain that we had enough time in between Sunday school and this service to transition. And uh, we've come to find out we've had a little bit more time than we need. So we're going to pull the service time back five minutes all right five minutes to 10 40 this starts next week so um, next saturday night uh, remember that it starts at 10 40 on sunday morning and be ready to set your clocks back and have that wonderful extra hour of sleep next saturday night all right so do remember that um, this week is halloween and uh, so there's a really good chance people are going to come knock on your door that don't knock on it all year long and uh, in the process of moving the offices, we found a box of Halloween tracks that we didn't realize that we had. And so we have those available to you at the Welcome Center. They look like this. Um, don't just give this out. Please give kids out candy with this, okay? And place it in their bag. Um, it has a church name on the back. It's an invitation. It's a short presentation of the gospel. And I think we have packages of 25 or 50 you can pick up at the Welcome Center and pass those out um, as individuals come by your house um, this Thursday night. And one last thing, it is time for Room in the Inn again. And uh, we need some innkeepers and we need uh, individuals that can provide a supper or a breakfast. If you're not familiar with Room in the Inn, um, in short, it is a, a collaboration of multiple churches that take a particular night um, to sleep those who are in our homeless community in Warren County. Um, they are registered, they are screened. Um, this is a great program. Um, it is easy, easy, easy to do. And if you would feel like you'd like to be a blessing to them, we have switched one of the nights that we're doing it. It's actually going to be on Thursday nights. We used to do Tuesday nights. Go by. There are seven, seven nights, seven Thursday nights in between mid-November and early March that we need to cover as a church for meals as well as some innkeepers. We need two innkeepers a night. And so do keep that in mind. Would you stand everywhere? I want to pray for you. And uh, then we are going to to dive into singing today and thinking about the glorious nature of the cross. Join me in prayer. Father, we pray for your blessings upon this time as we worship you, as we honor you, as we lift you up, as we sing your praises. Father, we pray that we would recognize the beauty of who you are and your free gift of salvation. Pray for each one here that you would meet them exactly where they are today and take them where you want them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus. 
this gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet. So worshiping with strangers. So I want you to turn around and talk to those people in front of you and behind you. Make sure you know their name and tell them that you're glad to see them this morning. your seats from meeting all those new faces. Join us in uh, continuing to worship, sing, oh praise the name with us this morning.
persuaded that not even death or life, angels or rulers, things present or things to come, hostile powers, height or depth, or any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. the great I am, the great I am, and the mountains shake before him, the demons run and flee, at the mention of the name King of Majesty, and there is no power in hell. Or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am, 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 the great I am.
pray with us today as we pray over our tithes and offerings? Now it might work. There we go. At this time, if you have a child ages four to second grade, they're going to be dismissed out the back doors and down the hallway to kids' worship. Ages four to second grade. If this is your first time with us and want to follow them to see where they'll be heading, please feel free to follow them at this time. Stop fighting a fight that's already been won And I am redeemed And you set me free So I'll shake off these heavy chains And wipe away every stain now I'm not who I used to be, I am redeemed, I'm redeemed. All my life I have been called unworthy. Name by 
the voice of my shame and regret But when I hear you whisper, child, lift up your head. I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. And I am redeemed. And you set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains. And wipe away every stain Now I'm not who I used to be Because I don't have to be The old man inside of me Cause his day is long dead and gone Because I've got a new name A new life, I'm not the same And a hope that will carry me home I am redeemed, you set me free, so I'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away every stain, cause I'm not who I used to be, I am redeemed. Cause you set me free So I'll shake off these heavy chains And wipe away every stain Now I'm not who I used to be Oh God, I'm not who I used to be Jesus, I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed. Thank God, redeemed. Thank you, Ricky, for uh, turning our hearts to the Word today. If you have your Bible, would you open up to Luke chapter number 15? Luke chapter number 15, and uh, we will dive in um, there this morning. You know, when I was on um, sabbatical in July, uh, one of the tasks that I had was to uh, um, fill out a preaching calendar as to where we wanted to go and and some of the things that I wanted to do and explore in the scriptures. And so I was able to plan out until until February of the year 2021, um, praying over the text and praying over kind of the things we want to talk about and where we are as a church, where we need to be. And the whole time I do things like that, I just kind of laugh. I, I laugh because I, I think it's important to have a plan, and I think it's important to teach systematically through the Scriptures, but then I realize also um, that there is the leadership of the Holy Spirit that uh, week to week will guide us through the text and tell us uh, what to do and what not to do. And so all that to say this, if you've looked at your bulletin and uh, uh, you've been here for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about healthy tensions, and uh, I've got a really good sermon on submission and authority that you're going to hear in January now, and uh, along with a couple of the topics on that, and so we're going to be leaving that for a couple of months and, and picking that up for a, for a few weeks in January, and, um, and truthfully, uh, here's what happened, is um, as I was going through this in my mind, going through the study of the week um, yesterday, and particularly even late last night, um, it just didn't fit for today. And so uh, um, the Lord began to lay this passage on my heart, and I want us to think about Luke 15 and uh, this particular thought of what we would say messy church, okay? Messy church, and so we'll dive in at this particular point. Um, I was reading about this, and uh, one particular quote actually turned my heart to begin to think. Um, There's a guy by the name of Tim Challies who is a a blogger about the New Testament church, and uh, Tim Challies wrote this, and here's what he said. If our, if our churches reflect God's heart for the lost, they will be full of people with problems, full of people showing the consequence of a lifetime of wondering. And this means that the church may not be a safe and easy place. It may not be a place full of people who have it all together. It may be messy. It should be messy. And thank God if it is messy. So I want us to think this morning on that particular thought pattern, that the church church should be messy. 
Now, I'm not talking about walls um, not looking like they've been painted or things out of place. Our staff will tell you that uh, that's a big deal to me, that everything looks good, the parking lot looks good, all the landscaping looks good. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about individuals that come in God's house and that we promote that it is okay for you to be messed up and walk in this place. That it's okay for things not to be okay in your life and that we have a sign on the front door that is spoken with the smiles of our faces and the warmness of our heart that says everybody's welcome here. And, and that when we gather together, we realize that it is not a collection of pristine saints that have everything together, that it just might be, that it just might be an emergency room full of sinners that are desperately looking for a word from the Lord. And so when we think about that today, I want you to... Um, Go down this path with me. Now, let's say some things about the text real quick. In Luke chapter number 15, Luke is recording the words of Jesus. This is late in the ministry of Jesus. And he has been dealing with all types of people all along the way. He's dealt with sick people. He's dealt with individuals who are demon-possessed. He's dealt with individuals who are self-righteous. He's dealt with religious people. He has dealt with lost people. He has dealt with all kinds of individuals and so he comes, and his fame is well spread, and individuals are coming to him, and religious people look on, and they have an observation about what's going on in the ministry of Jesus. And so it's important, if we're going to understand what Luke 15 has to teach us, is that we look at what Jesus is addressing. The question, or the subject, or the thought that he is addressing Early in the chapter, it makes the rest of it make sense, okay? So read with me verses 1 and 2. It says, all the tax collectors and sinners. Now, just in case you're, you're not you're familiar with Scripture, that's okay. When it's talking about tax collectors, those were, that was a description of those who would be looked upon as messy people. Those would be thieving people. Those would be individuals who are with, without scruples. And think about how it's said. It's tax collectors and sinners. That these guys are one and the same. So keep reading. And all the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. Think about the scene there. Is that these people who are on the outside looking in, these people who are outcast, feel welcome to go and listen to Jesus. There's a, certainly a word there for the church. But now look at the religious people and their response in verse number 2. And the Pharisees... And the scribes were complaining. What a great word. They were just complaining. Now, now, think about the scene. What are they complaining about? They're complaining that these people are coming to listen to Jesus. Simply put. And then they add some stuff to it. Look, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. What a complaint. This man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Now, in, in a culture where... These individuals would have sought ritual cleansing if they came into physical contact with somebody who was a Gentile or somebody they deemed to be a sinner. They said, how awful is it that Jesus eats and meets with sinners? Now that's the context. This is what's going on. And so Jesus answers them with three parables. He answers them with the parable of the lost sheep. He answers them with the parable of the lost coin, and then he answers them with the parable of the lost son, or maybe even more familiar as the prodigal son. And so when we think about parables, just real quick, in studying God's word, ultimately they teach one truth. It's an illustration. It's a made-up story that teaches one particular truth, and the way that we gain the truth from that is, is we look at what's said in the end, we look at the dialogue between the major players that are there, and what is celebrated at the end of these particular parables tells us what the meaning of the parable is. So remember, that's the back of your head. Jesus is addressing those who have a problem with him eating and sitting or meeting with sinners and tax collectors. So we pick up in verse number 18, let me give you just a little bit more background. If you're not familiar with the story, a man had two sons. One of the sons said, I'm not going to wait for you to die. I want all my inheritance now. 
The story goes on that the prodigal son went and he spent all of his money. He lived, the King James word is he lived sumptuously, whatever sumptuously is. And, and, and he lived a reckless life. Later on in the parable, it talks about how he was with prostitutes and, and, and how his life was not measuring what his father would have expected from him. He wakes up one day with nothing to eat and no money whatsoever. He finds employment working for a farmer, and he is there where the hogs are dwelling. Now think about this for just a moment. In the first century, particularly to a Jewish individual, that was the most unclean of animals. They didn't want to touch them. They certainly didn't want to eat them. I don't know about you. Thank, thank the Lord for the liberation of the gospel. I sure enjoy my bacon, right? But these guys couldn't do that, right, whatsoever. So he is, he is eating from the holes or the pods that the swine had gone through. And he comes to himself, and he said, Servants in my dad's house live better than this. What in the world am I doing here? Pick up with me in verse number 18. Let's read the rest of the parable. I'll get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father, but while the son was still a long way off, his father says to him, saw him, and filled with compassion, he ran and threw his arms around his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and, in no, and, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then he bring the fattened calf and he slaughtered it, and let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine, who was dead, is alive again. And he who was lost was now found. And so they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and he came near. The house he, excuse me, came near the house. He heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of his servants, questioning what these things meant. Your brother is here, he told him. And your father has slaughtered the fattened calf, because he has him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him, but he replied to his father, Look, I've been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat so that I would celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. And here's the father's response, Son, he said to him, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But, but we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. If we begin to derive the meaning of this particular parable, and looking at the words and looking what is said in the end and knowing why Jesus said it, we know that it is addressed to those of the attitude of the older brother. Certainly there are many tentacles of, of doctrine and theology we can take from the example of the Father. There are many teachings about the love of God and, 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 and the purpose of Christ that we can take through this particular picture. But what it, who it was spoken to were religious, self-righteous individuals that look their noses down at somebody that maybe, maybe their life's a little bit messy. And so the text would say this. If we're going to talk about the meaning of the story in one sentence, it's this. is that God accepts all repentant sinners. God accepts all repentant sinners, no matter how outcast they may be. The picture of the grand story of the Bible is given beautifully in these particular words is that God accepts all, regardless of how outcast that they have been. So, for our purposes in the time that we have left today, I want you to think about this as how we view this as a church. How we as the people of God make certain that we never take on the posture of the brother but we always look through the eyes of the loving Father. So what's a messy church look like? What's a messy church? How do we characterize a messy church? Let's, let's list out a couple of things. Number one, 
the messy church. A place where the need for repentance is affirmed and the act of repentance is celebrated. The place where the need for repentance is affirmed and the act of repentance is celebrated. Verse number 20 and 21, you see the picture highlighted again. While the sun was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And then the son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and against earth. You know, we often say, or there's a buzz, buzz phrase in the church today, a lot of individuals that say this, and it's, it's absolutely true, it's just incomplete. It says, Jesus accepts you just the way you are. That is absolutely true, but make sure that you put a comma in that sentence and not a period. And he loves you enough, and he loves you enough to tell you that he doesn't want you to stay there, right? That we recognize what the Bible says about repentance is that whoever we are, messed up as we are, sins, a many coming out of our lives, that we recognize the beauty of what is repentance. The word repentance simply means to turn. It means a change of mind. It means I am walking according to my flesh, and so therefore I am going to turn to my gloriously heavenly Father, and I want to be living by his steps. I want to be guided by his truth. I want to be transformed by his gospel. A repentance is a turning around or a turning to God. And we as a church, or any church for that matter, does you a disservice if we do not tell you the beauty of repentance and turning from sin. In no way, in no way is it helpful or is it loving to affirm to an individual that you can turn to Jesus and still continue in your sin? That's not loving at all, right? It is sin that makes us messy to begin with. It is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that radically changes our heart. But, but don't stop there, though. Not the fact that we just affirm it. We also have to celebrate it. What did this father do? What did he do? He runs to his son, and he throws his arm around him. He stunk like the pig pen. He, he, he had the wares of his reckless life on him. And that daddy threw his arms around him. And then he began to celebrate. And he kills the fatted calf. He says, we must rejoice that my lost son has now been found. See, a messy church preaches a message of repentance, and it celebrates the radical change that Jesus Christ can make in the life of somebody else. Have you watched the news this week? Have you, have you seen some of the things that have come out? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there. Maybe you've read it. Did, did anybody read the headlines about Kanye West this week? And, 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 his, and his new, uh, I don't even know what to call him anymore. It's not an album, is it? His new thing that came out, Jesus is King, Right? And, 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 and you know what? A lot of individuals can look in, in, in skepticism at this individual, right? Um, I even see, feel like I'm speaking in the dark. I've never listened to any of his music at all, right? I know it's a shock that that's not my genre, right? But, but, but I tell you what, how, how about somebody proclaiming that Jesus is king? You go, well, is it real in his life? You're not the judge of that, and neither am I. But praise the Lord that somebody is proclaiming that Jesus Christ can radically change your life. And you know what? We'll sit there and we'll, with pom-poms, ready to celebrate a gospel witness that continues on. See, it is about preaching repentance, important, and celebrating a life that's been radically changed and turned to God. That's what a messy church looks like. All right, we're going we're gonna to talk about repentance and we're going to celebrate it. Number two, all right? Um, a messy church is a place where forgiveness is offered and sought. A messy church is a place where forgiveness is offered and sought. You don't see the father contemplate whether he's going to forgive his son or not, does he? The, the, the verse number 18 says this, I'll get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. He is seeking out the father and he is seeking him out for forgiveness. And in the actions of this loving father all the way through, we don't see one who is ready to withhold forgiveness from the one who seeks it. A messy church is a place where forgiveness is offered and sought. Where individuals recognize that there are failures. Individuals recognize that we are 
that we are fleshly people and that we offer forgiveness and we seek that same forgiveness. We don't sweep things under the rug. The son knew that he could go to the father. The response was not this. Well, you know what? I'm going to give you a couple months to prove yourself. He didn't say, well, I'm going to take you up on that servant thing. Maybe you can work for me for a little while. He didn't say, well, you know what? This will pass. You know, I'm going to give you two or three months, and, and, and then you'll be on to something else. No, he forgave, and he wrapped his arms around the neck of his wayward son. That's what a messy church looks like. We seek forgiveness. Think about this for just a moment, just, just going on rather quickly. Um, that a messy church is a place where the wonder of salvation is proclaimed and prioritized. If you look in the middle of this parable, again, we often say this in Bible study, always pay attention to concepts and significant pregnant words that are repeated. Always pay attention to them because it gives us to the meaning of the particular passage. Twice in this story, in verse number 24, verse number 32, the same phrase is repeated. One time speaking it to all of his household, the other speaking it to the self-righteous older brother. Let's just read it there in verse 24 and 32. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And verse number 32, he's not just the son, he's this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and and is found. This process of what takes place in salvation. Ephesians 2, the one that's been made alive. The uh, First John chapter number 1, this child of darkness has now become a child of light. That there's this radical transformation that is spiritual in design. It's taking place in the life of this individual. That salvation has radically changed them from an enemy of the cross to a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And so a messy church has to be a place where we affirm where we lift up the importance of salvation and we constantly proclaim it. Now, let's dive in here just a little bit when we think about this concept of salvation or the wonder of salvation. It is correct to speak of salvation as a point in time. In my life, it's hard to believe, 34 years ago, April the 17th, 1985, the only reason I know that is somebody told me to write it down. 34 years ago, there was a point in time where I responded to a gospel message, and the Lord Jesus radically changed my life for eternity. And I am forever grateful for that particular day. But let me tell you some good theology. Salvation did not stop that day although that's when it began. And when we think about our entire walk in the Christian faith, is that we use that type of language to refer to our walk. It is the gospel being lived out in our life. It is salvation progressively working in our life. I was saved at a point in time I am being saved continually, and one day I will forever be saved in the presence of God for eternity. And that the work of salvation in my life that saved me from the penalty of sin is progressively giving me the power over sin on a daily basis. Now let me tell you what I mean by this and why we're saying this, that we prioritize this, and we, and we constantly lift up the importance of salvation. Have you ever known anybody where their heart comes a little bit calloused, the desire for the heart of God becomes a little cold, and they're not walking in their faith? We used to use terms in church like backslidden, um, a few other words that we would use to, to refer to an individual like that. Now, I would affirm this completely and totally. If, if Jesus Christ radically saved them at one point in time, they know Christ is Lord and Savior. This is a big discussion. 
We can talk about it from a lot of different angles. But they've allowed the cares of this world to mess them up. To, to distract them from what's most important. And, and, and think about this. If we are going to proclaim the beauty of salvation, even the power over sin on a daily basis, is that that person should feel welcome when they walk in the church. We, we shouldn't grant them and say, man, how long has it been since you've been here? And say, well, the, the, the roof's not caving in today, right? Yeah, you, ought to, you ought to probably wrap your arms around the neck. Say, man, I am, I'm so glad you're in God's house. Did you hear the song Ricky t- sang this morning? I am redeemed. I am redeemed. That's, a, that's an individual that's been redeemed by the hand of the enemy. And, and maybe some things, maybe some situations, maybe some people, uh, may, maybe some some. some Maybe some Christians along the way kind of help mess things up in their life. And, and are we willing? Are we willing to see what God can do even in the life of one that has just grown a little bit cold? Salvation must be proclaimed. It, it, it must be prioritized. That this is what you're living out. You know, when I call people to service within the local church, please know what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to live out your faith by serving the Lord Jesus Christ. At no time do we want to elevate the organization. At no time are we attempting to say, let's see how big we can get for bigness sake. It is living out your faith and your gifts for the glory of the Lord on a daily basis, and the wonder of salvation, the fact that we were dead and now we're alive, the fact that we were lost and now we have been found, is personified in our steps Sunday to Saturday, every day of the year. We prioritize the wonder of salvation and living it out. Just, just real quick here, um, the messy church is a place where self-righteous people should not feel comfortable. Let me repeat that because apparently you didn't hear me right. The messy church is a place where self-righteous people should not feel comfortable. Amen, Amen, right? Um, You know what? A self-righteous person within the church house should feel out of place. And I would say, you know why a lot of churches die? Because they are perfectly in place. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If somebody walks through the door, regardless of their lifestyle, regardless of where they come from, regardless of what their background is, regardless of what their choices have been, and and, and somehow you have a problem worshiping with them or being in the same room with them, you realize the problem is you and not them, right? Is is that this self-righteousness is exactly what Jesus is talking about. And the interesting thing is this, is that, is that the, the father in this affirms the relationship with the older brother. He's not speaking to an outcast himself. He's not speaking to the lost himself. He's speaking to one that would be in the kingdom. And he's saying, you need to get over how important you are and embrace the one and push away that self-righteousness and you should never feel comfortable being self-righteous in the church. Last thing is this, is the messy church. The church is filled with individuals who have been redeemed by the hand of God that recognize that we are outcasts and know that we are here by the grace of God is a place more concerned about the future of a saint than the past of a sinner. Frank, can I tell you something today? In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation time. And, and, and whoever you are and wherever you've come from, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond in faith to Jesus. Maybe, maybe this, this first response is just to have a conversation with somebody about what, what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you're starting at square one or square ten. We don't care. But it's an opportunity for you to, to, to seek 
who Christ is in salvation. And, and can I tell you this? We are much more concerned about what God has for your future than what your past has been. Wherever you've been, whatever pathway you've gone down, and even if you think that the choices that you've made in the sum total of your life make you even distant from God, can I tell you, we were all distant from God because of sin. And that He wants to save you. And I am much more concerned about your future than I am about your past. And I would love to show you from the Word of God who you can be and what God can do through you. Yesterday afternoon, me and Kaylee Beth were cleaning up in the garage in our house. It was kind of the, uh, the last bastion of things that needed to be organized at the new house. So we have a, a two-car garage that you can barely get one car in, right? Anybody with me on that one? But so uh, really what, what the intent was was this, is that we wanted to, uh, we wanted to clear enough junk out of the way and, and put it up in enough places where you could comfortably open the doors of that one car in that two-car garage. You, you know what I'm saying, right? But it's, something amazing happened when we began to put things up and everything. Man, we got on a roll. And I said, could it be? Could we maybe get two cars in this garage? And, and, and you know what? We, we park Amy's car in there, right? Because Amy doesn't need to be out there scraping her windshield. Some of you women say amen on that, right? And, and, and so I, I said, I said can, can I get my car in here too? And it's amazing what happened was this. Is as we began to clean out the mess and look for places for things to go, that cleaning out the mess clarified the potential of the room. J Jesus, Jesus accepts you right where you are. And, and, and as you walk, and that mess just begins to get cleaned out, it will clarify the potential of what God has in store for you. And let's focus on who God has for you to be as opposed to who you have been. So church, the question is this. What's it going to be? Are we going to be the church of the older brother? It has some really, really sophisticated looking people in it. Has some, has, has some really knowledgeable people in it. Church of the older brother that has some really self righteous people in it. Or we're going to choose, we're going to choose to be the messy church where it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to walk through the door messed up to find the one that can radically change your life. Let, let's be the church of the loving Father. A couple opportunities that you have. And room in the end, some individuals that, that they don't have a high estimation of themselves at times. They need some loving people to wrap their arms around them. Tonight, I can guarantee you on our parking lot, we're going to have some messed up people. We are. And, and, and they're here to get their kids some candy. And praise the Lord that we'll be here to provide it. Why don't we give them a smile and give them a little bit of Jesus while they're here. We've been talking about who you're, who's your one, and we've been talking about that. You know what? Maybe, maybe your one desperately needs, desperately needs to find hope that's in Christ alone. Who in the next 30 days can you invite to be in God's house with you that doesn't know the Lord? Would you stand everywhere and just join me in prayer? Friend, I don't know how the Lord's speak, speaking with you today, but let me just say this. If you need to respond to the gospel message, there's a couple of ways in which you can do that. I'm going to be right down here at the front, and I would love to put you with somebody that can take the Word of God and just talk to you about your relationship or whatever your need is. To my left, there's a set of double doors, has a sign over the top of it that says next steps. Right inside 
those doors, we have some counselors that would like to meet you exactly where you are. Realize that in a big room with a lot of people, that's not the most appealing way to respond at times. And so we want to meet you exactly where you are. So if you want to make your way down the hallway, go out the back door, go out the side door. These doors are wide open for you to respond today. However the Lord leads, however you want to respond, do that today. Let's pray together. Father, we pray. We pray for this time of invitation as we respond, as we seek your face, as we seek your heart. Father, we pray that we would be faithful. And Lord, that individuals that, that, that need you would respond today. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name.